on Zoom and YouTube Live. Uh, if you are watching us on YouTube Live, uh, but you do have a ticket for Python Japan, I recommend you instead use Zoom so you can ask questions and participate in the chat. You should have the links to that on your Compass ticket page. Uh, for everybody joining us today in Zoom, thank you very much. Uh, the way the Q&A is going to work in the end is that you can use the raise hand feature of Zoom if you would like to ask the question directly. And so we will allow you to share your microphone and if you want to your video uh, to ask your question. And the way that works is at the bottom of your Zoom window, there should be a participants button. If you could click that and if just for testing, um, you could please raise your hand on Zoom for me. Just to see that, that uh, everything works. Thank you very much, Zach. トークは終わって終わったところでえっと、Q&Aタイムはスームのえっと、レイズハンズ、ピーチを使ってますので、使いたいのでえっと、スームウィンドウのに関してのパーティシパントをボタンがあるので、そちらをしてレイズハンドを
kind of breaking software apart, things how things uh, come together and how they work behind the scenes, which is kind of how I dove into the Python debugging engine and learned uh, about it. To give you just a bit more context, Rookout is a secure platform for live data collection and debugging. Uh, Rookout is reimagining the debugger to work in remote environments, to work in cloud environments, to work in distributed environments. We utilize non-breaking breakpoints so that you set a, break, a non-breaking breakpoint on a line of code and you can instantly get data from that line of code. And so you get a snapshot, stack trace, variable values, everything you might need without having to write that into the code, without having to redeploy or restart, kind of bridge, bridging the gap between traditional debugging and a production and remote monitoring. We've developed support in Rookout for a Python, Node.js, JVM, and .NET. And working on the Python support, I've, I dove into the Python runtime, especially the debugging mechanisms and the bytecode uh, mechanisms in the interpreter. And I've learned a lot. And I want to share some of what I've learned here today with you. So to give you some context, this is what Rookout looks like. You set a breakpoint. It goes active. You, uh, you trigger an action and then you get the data and you can instantly see it. So kind of think through it for a second. What are the challenges of making such a technology possible, of such an experience possible? How do you go about instantly collecting data on the fly from a running application, especially in a production environment? So the way we figured it, those are the main concerns you have to look to take care of. First, you have to find some way to do to execute the remote data collection to collect data from those processes running remotely. You have to make sure that technology is non-breaking because you don't want to stop a production application. You can't uh, have a developer st standing by and slowing down the server or having it carry out uh, action step by step. You have to make sure you're not making any changes to the application. You're not changing, you're not impacting its correctness or its stability because those environments are obviously very sensitive. And you have to make sure you have zero negligible performance overhead. Obviously everything you do in computers takes time, but you must make sure it, this time doesn't negatively impact the overall application performance where you're being hosted. So how did we go about implementing this next gen debugger within the Python runtime, within the Python framework? So there are a lot of Python debuggers out there. I would love you to take a couple of seconds and think through it, which, which is your favorite debugger? If this was an interactive session, I would have you call them out in the audience. For now, you can each call them out uh, privately in your own room. But quickly going through them, we have the Python standard library, PDB, which is a model that allows you to debug a kind of a very simple command line debugger for Python. You have the PyDev debugger, which is an open source debugger that backs debugging for both PyCharm and Eclipse. And other ideas such as IDLE, Atom, have their own built-in debuggers. And the first thing we did in Rookout, building our own debugger, was taking a look at some of those debuggers, especially the open source ones, and trying to figure out how do they work, what's their performance, and what's good or bad about the way they're implemented. And it seems all of them are implemented the same way. All of them use this method, sysSetRace, which is part of the Python standard library, part of the sys module. 
and allows you to debug the application. Now, this is a very complicated module. Here you can see this. Here you can see a screenshot from the Python docs for this function, and it's pretty damn complicated. I'm going to walk you through it over the next few slides about how how it works, what it's doing and what we did with it in Rookout. Sysctrace registers a callback for the Python interpreter. Now this callback is invoked on four interpreter events. Whenever a function is called, online execution, on function return, and on exception raise. This callback is often referred to as trace function within the docs and let's take a look at what it looks like. So here we have the ex our example callback. We call it simple tracer. It accepts three arguments, frame, which is uh, the current stack frame. And I'm gonna dive deep in deep, a bit deeper into that in a bit. It receives the event argument, which is just a string, either call, line, return, on, or exception based on which object it is, which kind of type of event it is. And it has arg, which is an optional argument based on the event type, but for the most part, you can ignore it. Our function is very simple. It starts out by collecting, getting the code object from the frame. Then it gets the function name from the code object, the line number from the frame. Then it prints out the event the function name and the line number and returns itself. We are gonna dive deeper into why this function returns itself and what it means. But if you're gonna look at code samples for a C set race across the web, you're gonna see that most of them return themselves, at least in some cases. So let's see what happens when this function is, when this code is executed. Here we have a function definition for A which calls B, function definition for B. We have C set trace, calling, setting our simple tracer, and then we invoke A. Side by, line by line, this is the first line that gets executed after both functions are defined. Then A gets executed. Now this is gonna be the first event we're gonna see. Call A1, essentially invoke call function A, line one, execute line within function A, the line we're executing is number two, call function B in line four, execute within function B, line five, return from function B in line five, return from function A at line two. That's that's the line by line breakdown. Now let's figure out again what it means and how we got here. So as I mentioned, this the simple tracer like returns itself. In this case, it always returns itself. The reason it does that is because in fact, within the Python, Systrace model, there are actually two tracing functions, not just one. When you call sysctrace, you register the global trace. So. The global trace is thread global and is invoked whenever a new function is called. So once we set a global trace on every function call, the Python interpreter invokes our global trace before executing the new function. And then our global trace returns a local trace. And the local trace is called for every event within the function, for the line event, for the return event, and for the exception event. Keep in mind that when evaluating the line return and exception events, the global trace event makes no difference. 
all that matters is the frame event, the frame, the frame trace function. And it's also worth noting that once Python is created a new frame as a part of a function call, there is no documented way to create the local trace function for it. Once it call, it's called, that's it, you can change it. And if there wasn't a global trace event at the time the frame was created, then you can't set a trace function to it at all. So let's look back at what was actually happening in that simple code example behind the scenes. Sysetrace is called setting simple tracer as the global tracer. Then A is called and the global simple tracer returns itself as the trace function for the local frame. B is called and again, our global tracer is invoked. Notice the global tracer is invoked, not the local tracer to which returns simple tracer. And so simple trace is set as the local trace. And that's it. Whenever, whenever all those other events happened, local return, except so on, those are all executed by the like event. Now, how do you handle multi-tracing? I've mentioned the global trace is per thread and there isn't any way to set the, the, the global trace function for remote thread, but there is a very nice function called set trace within the threading module, which is gonna set your, your trace function to any newly created thread. So once we call threading set trace with our trace function, every new th thread created is gonna have this set, set thread, is, is gonna have this trace function created. This must be called as uh, early as possible because otherwise you're gonna meet threads. Every thread that has already been created, then for that you can't, you can't remotely set is a global trace function. And also note this doesn't cover the underlying thread module and other low level implementation. If somebody is bypassing threading, then your trace function is not gonna take hold. You might be wondering about other threading modules, whether it's C extension such as G event or eventlet, or even the newer async IO models. So all of those uh, lightweight threading are don't make, have any impact. When you set the global tracing functions, it's gonna be shared among greenlets and among other mini threads because the thread events are what matters, the thread objects. So how easy it is to build a debugger? How fast can we build our own naive debugger in Python? Let's take a look. We start out by inheriting for something that's already there. There is a, another Python standard module called PDB. This is what PDB, the Python debugger is built on. And it's a base class for implementing debuggers. We start out by inheriting from it. And then we add our constructor. The constructor calls the base class. We create our own local breakpoints dictionary to keep track of our breakpoints. And we call Ceph setrace, which installs BDB trace function as the global trace function. Then we create our own set breakpoint function, which we expose to the world. This function gets the file name and the line number we want to set a breakpoint on, as well as a method for data collection to be invoked once the breakpoint is hit. We call set set break, which is the function we inherited from BDB for taking care of setting breakpoints. And then we just add the method callback to our dictionary. And finally, we override user line. User line is simply the function uh, 
BDB invokes whenever it thinks it might have hit a breakpoint and we get the frame object. And so essentially BDB takes care of setting the global tracer and based on the breakpoint we've asked for decides where to go into local tracing and where to invoke us. Now, we start out by checking if break here, we're checking if there is actually a breakpoint here. User line might also be invoked for other reasons by BDB. So we might be called too often. We get a fa file name and line number from the frame using inspect get frame info. We are gonna touch on the inspect module a bit later. We get a callbacks from our breakpoints dictionary, and then we execute them one by one. So that was very, very easy. In just 30 lines of code, three functions, we've implemented our own very naive debugger. Let's see how it holds up. I remind you, we are looking for performance grade uh, debugging. We want to have negligible to none global hoverheads and minor cost for every single breakpoint. For our performance tests, we went through a very simple approach. We created two simple methods. One we've called it empty method, which is just pass and doesn't do anything. And the second is a simple method that sets A to one, B to two, C to three, blah, blah, blah. Now we're gonna test four scenarios with each of those. We're gonna test without a debugger, what's gonna happen when we aren't there. We're gonna test with our debugger, but without setting any breakpoints. We're gonna test with our debugger with a breakpoint set in a different file. The reason we do that is because we're gonna dive in and see that BDB uses the files we set breakpoints on as a hint into how to help optimize break uh, debugger performance. And we're gonna test with a breakpoint in the same file. Note that in all of those cases, we're never inv actually invoking the breakpoints. We are just measuring the global over it for how we impact the system without yet going into the cost of a single breakpoint. So those, that's the performance for running those, uh, those methods one million time within a loop. You can see that without a debugger, an empty method take and a simple method takes both well under a single millisecond. Once we turn our debugger, then things are higher with a debugger and a breakpoint in a different file or even in the same file, then, well, that's pretty terrible. And those are hundreds, many hundreds of a percent of a penalty, possibly thousands or tens of thousands of percent in performance penalty, and definitely not something we can achieve. So let's see what we can do to optimize it. So if you remember, we've discussed global tracing versus local tracing. Global tracing means we are called once for every function call, while local tracing means we are called once for every line. Obviously, local tracing is much, much, much more expensive than global tracing, which is why they're separated in the first place. So by avoiding local tracing, by having local tracing called as little as possible, then you are requiring the interpreter to do less extra work. And we can, we're saving a lot of on performance. Other than that, the two most common events are call events. Do we want to step into that function? And line events, whenever a line is executed. So we want to optimize our performance for those events, especially for the hot code pass. So for instance, if we are trying to, if we're saying we want to, uh, to avoid local tracing 95% of the time, then it's okay for the 5% of the time, we want to make a yes decision, slightly more expensive, but we want 
90, 95% of those times where we're trying to make a no decision to be as fast as possible. Same goes for lines. Most lines aren't gonna have a breakpoint. So we want to be able to decide there is no breakpoint as fast as possible. And it's okay figuring out there is a breakpoint takes a bit longer. So after uh, spending those performance op optimization, this is what we've got. As you can see, performance is much, much, much better, but we're still looking at five times as much performance case. We, if, as long as there is no breakpoint or breakpoint is in a separate file, then we're seeing pretty big hits, but it seems like we might be heading in the right direction. But once we set a breakpoint in the same file, then performance again skyrockets and things are pretty bad. There is another quick way you can optimize virtually any Python code. There is a Python package called Cython, which works by building your, your Python code by transpiling it into C code and then compiling that C code as a native extension. This can provide huge performance boosts in specific scenarios. And when we ran, we, when we migrated some of this code to Cython and further optimized it, this is what we've got. You can see it's a pretty huge boost. We are about two or three times faster in most scenarios, but still performance here is nowhere in sight. We're still looking at, we are still three, maybe four times, some cases 10 times slower than working without us. So still that's not what we want to, not what we want to be. The next step we've took was, let, let's, let's take a step back for a second and see what can we actually achieve here. So Python BDB is very, very, very naive. It was never built to be optimized. It's not used in production or complex scenarios. And we can, we can make huge impact on making it faster. And if somebody actually cared, many of those improvements can even be added to the BDB upstream. Some of those improvements can't because they they include removing various features within the BDB code base. But obviously, as always, performance becomes ever gradually harder to improve. And we're still very far away from our targets. So it's not clear how fast can we make it. But what happens if we set an empty tra tracer? So we've set this very simple tracer, pass tracer, get the fr frame, event, and arg, and just to tell yourself, this is probably the cheapest tracer you can have from a cost basis. And once we've run that, that's the performance we've seen. As you can see, performance here is still very bad. And in some cases, and actually it's not that far off from what we already had in the previous slides. So as you can see, there isn't much room for improvement. We're, we're kind of stuck with a, a ceiling. Let's try and figure out why. So I dove into CPython and it seems that turning on tracing sets up the CPython interpreter for a lot of extra work. Some of it is in Python, but unfortunately some of it is in C. As you can see here, the maybe call line trace, which involves a lot of very complex logic that happens on every opcode execution. As I'm sure you are aware, there, there can be many opcodes per line. And so once we turn on tracing, even if we do nothing, the Python interpreter has to work a lot harder. And so we're slowing down the system significantly. So kind of what did we do? We figured out tracing is not gonna get us to production grade debugging. And we have to figure out a different approach for achieving that. 
And the way we ended up going was something quite else. Are you, how many of you are uh, familiar with the Python bytecode? So the Wikipedia definition is that bytecode is a form of instruction set designed for efficient execution by a software interpreter. Python compiles our sources into bytecode and then execute that bytecode in runtime. Taking a quick look at what it looks like, here we have the, a multiply function that accepts A and B, sets result as A times B, and returns the result. Any of you know what the bytecode for that looks like? So that's the bytecode. Bytecode is just a, a string a set of bytes that is, uh, ex makes it easier for uh, the Python interpreter to execute a code. Obviously that's not human readable, but if you use the this module within the Python standard library, you're gonna get something like that. Load fast uh, zero, which is A, load fast B, binary multiply the two operands on the stack A and B, store the result into result, load the result back onto the stack and return the result as a value. Python like most uh, uh, dynamic languages use a stack based machine and that's the bytecode for our simple function. The way the interpreter works is that it takes our source code, it compiles it. That's actually what's going into those PYC files you might be seeing on disk. Then it executes those byte, that bytecode within the interpreter loop. Now this is where tracing comes into play. Whenever the interpreter loops through the bytecode, it calls a trace function. And that's why it's so expensive performance-wise, because we are impacting a process that, take, that happens all the time. Every single opcode, the interpreter stops and go through the tracing configuration and tries to figure out, should tracing be called? And if so, calls it. And that's super expensive. And why it wasn't performant enough. So what we ended up doing was taking a different route. We went into the bytecode, we found the line of code, we we're trying to set a breakpoint on, and then we insert the breakpoint into the bytecode. This way the interpreter doesn't have to be aware of it, doesn't have to stop and think, do I need to set a breakpoint here? Do I need to invoke a breakpoint here? Every single instruction. Instead, the breakpoint is just a function call that occurs on the, specific, on the relevant line. Now, there are many tools for bytecode manipulation out there. Some of the common ones to get you started are the inspect and this module within the Python standard library. And unfortunately, there is no documented way for changing the bytecode from within Python. You're gonna need a native extension for that. And if you wanna take a look, Google has a, an open source project called Cloud Debug Python, which is a native extension that does exactly that. And you can take a look at that source code to get a reference. So we've gone through the basics. Now you have some understanding of how to break into the code using the tracing mechanism and how to use a bytecode manipulation to break into the code. But once you do, what do you do after you break? How do you get the data you need? So as we've mentioned, uh, in tracing frame is the first argument you get. And frame is actually the Python way of exposing the internals of the interpreter to the user through a Python object, which is kind of the Python way. The inspect module is a built-in module within the Python 
standard library, which allows you to use to look in to use those frame objects, get the data from them. And actually, unlike much of what I've shown you today, inspect is very well documented, very, very easy to use, no fancy tracing mechanisms, callbacks, native extensions. And performance is surprisingly awesome here because when using the, the frame object, we're just looking into the interpreter and it's very tightly coupled into how the interpreter works. We're just exposing the interpreter internals through Python. And so it's very, very fast and it's very, very easy to use. Let's take a look at a couple of code samples. We have our function test frame info. We start out by calling the inspect current frame module. The current frame is a utility function that just gets you the frame of this line, right now where the interpreter is. Besides being useful in some cases for production use, this function is also super useful for testing because if you're trying to test something around frame processing, you can just throw this function into a test case, write the, the code you're trying to test for, throw in inspect current frame, and you instantly get a frame of that object, which you can com then combine into unit test or even just tweak around with it and see in the debugger what's going on. Now, printing the frame object, what we get is just a traceback. We get the file name, the line number, the function, and the code context, which is just where we are, as well as the index, which is which indicates where we are on the call stack. Getting the local variables is very, very easy. Here, as I mentioned, in order to test something with current frame, all you have to do is take create the test case you want, and then call current frame. In this case, we print out F locals, which is simply a dictionary a dictionary of all local variables. This is actually how Python stores things in memory. And here you can see my dict is a dictionary with my key, my value. My string is a string. My list one is one, two, three. Very simple, very easy. What are some of the use cases for everything I've shown you here today? So first of all, you can always use this knowledge to show off your Python skills and just be a party person. You can use much of what I've shown you to get source information. For instance, the inspect current frame is how the built-in logging modules knows to print the file name and line number whenever you're logging, whenever you're using log, logging.info and so on. You can use this technology to walk up the stack if there is some piece of data up the stack you wanna get. And you can obviously use this knowledge to build your own debugger. All the code snippets I've shown uh, as part of this talk are available here in this public repo. So feel free to check it out. And that's, thank you very much. Do you have any questions for me? All right, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lira, uh, for your great presentation. That was very interesting uh, and we have Wow, we have actually quite a bit of time left, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, so if anybody has a question, please either raise your hand in the participants tab if you want to ask the question yourself or uh, write it in chat. Uh, so please yes, ask your questions. And while I wait for people to ask all these questions, I mean, if you don't mind a question from me, um, first of all, um, 
when you introduced all the different types of debuggers, uh, you forgot to mention my favorite debugger, which is print statements. That made me a bit sad. <laughs> but um, this this whole so what you ended up doing with this set is that you inject bytecode into the program's bytecode. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So it's, it literally puts a call function bytecode into the bytecode. Exactly. Wow. Uh, one, <laughs> well, once you get used to the idea, it's, it's cooler. Uh, one of yeah. the nice things about giving this talk to a live audience is that whenever you go to, into the debugger slide, everybody yells out their favorite debugger. Yeah. You don't get the same experience <laughs> in a virtual uh, setting. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate, yes. And then, the, so as you said, there's not really many good tools to rewrite bytecode. There's a lot of tools to read and inspect bytecode. And so mm -hmm. uh, you, you link to a, a, a code repository at the end. Does this include your tools that you built to rewrite bytecode? Because I'm, I, I'm aware that some of, there's some things that are very hard in doing that, like relative chunks and things like that. So we haven't yet released our uh, bytecode instrumentation to open source. We are uh, thinking through it. It's uh, trickier than it sounds. Uh, actually, in general, bytecode instrumentation is definitely a challenge. But I have to say that working with a just-in-time compiled and uh, interpreted languages tends to be much easier than we think about it. Uh, especially for those of us who have had more experience working with machine level assembly code, which is so has a lot more options and registers and various branch instructions and so on. The Python instruction set is much more limited. And so it tends to be much easier to edit it uh, on the fly. There aren't as many complexities and edge cases. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, um, participants, please ask your questions. There's no way you have no questions. Come on. Uh, Dima Dinama uh, wants to ask a question, so I will unmute you. Uh, please ask your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is about how we access, I still can understand how we access our variable value while debugging, well, debugging using your presentation. I think, can you show me again? Uh, do you mean uh, this slide? Use, uh, debugger or like, uh, yeah, yeah, some something like that. But is, is this only, wait a minute. Oh, so, so this is like, when I use debugger in VS Code, so it's like kind of interactive, but is this all of them run in a shell, Python shell, I mean? So th this example is running in a shell. So you uh, just... So, so we can... We, we, so when yeah, using Rookout... So we just run Python. Sorry? Okay. So when using Rookout, then you re connect the remote, remote uh, connect remotely to the relevant servers through our SaaS offering, which is something else. I haven't gone into that. Rookout has a lot of other features besides the debugger itself that allows the remote debugging portion. Uh, in this example, which we are just focusing on the accessing the local variables, once you call inspect coin frame, then you get an X you get access to wherever you are in the code. And in the inspect local, the inspect coin frames actually show you the internal data structure of the interpreter, which obviously include those variables because we are through the function right now. And the interpreter has to keep track of those variables for the function execution. Makes sense? So it, it can also work for multiple variables. Like I, I like to check lot of variable value so it's, it's it still works yeah it still works you have to keep in mind though that inspect current frame can easily create reference loops 
costs and can hurt your uh, garbage collector. So it's a function that you have to be very careful when using it. Okay, thank you so much. You're That's welcome. For me. Okay, thank you, Dima. Um, does anybody else uh, from the audience have a question? How soon does not make this easy? <laughs> <laughs> about the rate, maybe another question for me. So yeah, you, you, you did mention right now at the end that um, you have to be careful with uh, inspect that current frame. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that in the past, everybody always told me never to use that function because it was slow. But you mentioned in your talk that you actually found that there's no performance or no, no terrible impact using it. Are you aware if anything changed in like the last couple of years with that? No. I guess when you when you mean slow or fast, there is always a reference point. I wouldn't use inspect quant frame to access local variables as a way of life. <laughs> uh, it's not the it's a very implementation dependent. It's not very readable, and it definitely knows the performance way. I mean, you can you can implicitly access locals by just writing the local name. So there isn't any reason to uh, expect frame. But essentially, when you just write a local variable and the interpreter uh, runs it, what ha what's actually happening is that uh, current, frame, current frame F locals really is a, a dict. As you know, when you call a locals as a function, what you're getting is that object. And so obviously there are more the, degrees of uh, dereferencing. So just like uh, it's faster to use the local and more readable to use a local verb, just set the local variable name instead of calling locals and accessing the dictionary with a string. It, it's even slower to access current frame. But uh, if it's something you do once a second, then you're not gonna notice a difference. If you're gonna do it for every single variable access, then you're definitely gonna see an impact. But compared to the benchmarks I've shown you and what we've said, it, it's relatively cheap, at least for our perspective. At Rookout, we use this function and we, our breakpoints uh, take under a millisecond to collect the application state and ship it in the background before the application continues. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, in the, in the past, I've used the, the current frame to for login purposes to get the call side of a function and not to get the local function. So, but yeah, there's uh, all, a lot of um, yeah. interesting things you can do with that. Yeah. All Python loggers, including the built in logging modules, use current frame to mm. get the, the file name and line number. So, uh, while it's definitely not for everyday use, it's also somewhat standard in some use cases. All right, yeah. Okay. Once again, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Thank you. It looks like we are out of questions. Um, so if we could all get some uh, applause in chat for Liran for his great presentation. Um, some eight, eight in chat. Yes, that's, that's what I like to see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. So some announcement for what's going to happen next. Uh, next is the lunch break. And during the lunch break, starting from 1 p.m., we will have a lunch uh, panel discussion with some interesting speakers. And uh, as announced in this morning's opening session, unfortunately, that panel discussion is in Japanese only. But again, that's a great uh, chance for everybody to, to, to hone in your Japanese skills. 